And I do want to give a quick plug to a couple of other programs that we have coming up uh, that are sort of in, in line with the conversation uh, we're having this evening. So we are hosting two uh, race relations book discussions for teens and tweens. And I'll explain what those are if you're not familiar. Um, teens grades six through eight and tweens grades three through five. So it'll be a two-part book discussion and youth leaders will guide participants through a discussion focused on a chosen book title to talk about race and society. And these events are presented in partnership with the Golden Anti-Racist Coalition and all registrants uh, will receive a copy of the book that they can keep. So that's super cool. Um, we're gonna try to pop into chat if we can, the links to these programs. So for the teen program, that one's being held Saturday, February 20th and Saturday, March 20th from one to two. And the book is All American Boys by Jason Reynolds. And the tween program, again, that's gonna be three to five, um, grades three to five. And that program is going to be held on Wednesday, February 24th and March 24th from 6 to 7 p.m. And the book is Watson's Go to Birmingham by Christopher Paul Curtis. So it's very cool that um, registrants get to keep, get and keep a book. It is limited to 15 um, participants. So be sure to get folks registered if you know teens or tweens who are interested and there will be a wait list and hopefully we'll be able to get everybody. Um, registered and into the program. And as always, check out uh, jeffcolibrary.org for all of the virtual programs that we are offering right now in this crazy time. And uh, we have things you know, from story time to meditation and all sorts of stuff in between. So it's quite, quite the offering. All right, so let's dive in. So first I'm gonna give a little background about who Janet is, who I'm sharing this beautiful space with, right? Right now, Janet is an educator with over 20 years of experience working with students and families as a librarian and a literacy consultant. Janet has taught US history, ethnic studies, literacy and intervention and information literacy with students K through 12. And is currently the library services specialist for Denver Public Schools. Pretty awesome. She is a literacy engagement activist uh, who has worked to empower families and support their access to libraries and collections that feature positive representation of diverse children and families. So we're so happy to have you here, Janet. Thank you for joining us. And how about if you uh, take it away and get us kicked off here? Sure, sure. So I am so grateful that everyone is leaning in and being present for this conversation. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen to get us kind of grounded and um, ready for kind of this learning that we're going to do together. So just making sure that you can see my screen okay. Um, full size for us. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit tonight and get us grounded with this beautiful welcome that comes from the Zulu tradition of South Africa. And the welcome and the greeting is Sawubona. And Sawubona translates into, I see you. But this embodies this deeper level of knowing. It means that all of my attention is with you and that I allow myself to be seen by you. And that in this space, I'm gonna share my needs, my fears, my strengths. And um, Sawubona says, I accept this. I accept this about you, the fullness of who you are. And the response to this is Shikoba. Shikoba means I am grateful to be seen by you. I am grateful to know that I exist for you. And so this means that, you know, we come into existence for one another in meaningful relationships when we share not only our strengths, but also our vulnerabilities. And that is what makes this conversation so powerful is that we are showing up with true authenticity. So that is my greeting to you tonight, Isawubona. I hope that in your response in your heart, you're saying back to me, Shikoba. So to get us grounded, I'm just gonna talk about some norms for our conversation. Um, one is authenticity, that we wanna show up as our authentic selves. Um, you know, we all are wise in our lived experience and we bring unique funds of knowledge to the group. Um, we're gonna speak from our own story and speak from our own truth. And uh, during these sessions, we wanna just let ourselves be explorers and um, to show up less as an expert, but more as a colleague and a, 
and a friend and someone that we want to explore these concepts with and collaborators. Um, and that's allowing ourselves to learn from one another and the wisdom of each other. We want to hold space for the complexity. Too often we reach for simplistic answers to deeply complex questions. And so we want to honor that we um, allow ourselves to go deeper and gain insight and wisdom. And then as we share our stories and our experiences, we want to honor the space with uh, non-attribution um, outside of the space. So we want to think about um, just protecting and, and carrying out those stories and the learning, but less about, you know, I saw Janet in that meeting and she shared that she's struggling with some things. We want to really respect each other. Um, I also want to share this wonderful tool with you. And this is our kind of Google Jamboard. And so I'll just give you a second to see this title. It's um, Bitly, and maybe we can also put this into the chat. Let me I'm just kind of exit my full screen real quick to let you see um, what this looks like. Let me copy the link. Um, and so when you, when you go to this link, and I will drop a Jamboard link into the chat as well. Um, sometimes it's hard to find the chat. So it's in the chat and it's a Jamboard. And this one, it has um, some questions and some prompts. So first I'll give you a quick orientation to the power of the Jamboard. Oh, wow, look at how many, so many folks have joined it already so quickly. So one is I wanna let you know that here is um, a little sticky note icon. And here's where you can drop a sticky note. So you already did in the chat, sharing some of your hopes for tonight's session. Um, you are more than welcome to share this as well here in this um, sticky note, and you can choose your color. And then once you drop the sticky note, um, I'll just make one real quick. So I hope for a uh, courageous conversation that meets the needs of parents and families. Okay, so that's my hope for tonight, that we meet all of your needs. And so once you're done, you can hit cancel. And so just if you would like to drop a sticky note of some of your um, hopes for the session. And then here at the top in the center, there's a little down arrow that'll show you all of the boards. So if one board gets full, you can just go to the next one. Um, and there's some prompts on each board. That'll allow to make um, our thinking visible. And that's really powerful because um, we want to be able to co-create this vision of what it could be possible if we are brave enough and we engage in some of these conversations that might feel challenging, but are so rewarding and resource our children in really powerful ways. Um, you can navigate through the sheets this way. So here our prompt is what challenges come up for you when you talk about race with your child. Again, two sheets. Um, what are examples of ways your family is currently exploring race and identity and culture now? Um, and so feel free to explore and drop any sticky notes through the session as I present. And we'll revisit this board to just get a, a sense of where the conversation and what folks are really uh, thinking about and sitting with. I'm going to come back to this um, again. If you guys don't mind just uh, to drop the link a couple more times in case we get some new folks to the session. Um, so that's where we'll begin. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about, um, um, talk a little bit about some of the, the grounding that I want us to do and think about in um, our conversations about race, culture, and identity. So one, our babies, beautiful, born with all of our um, hopes and dreams for them. And, you know, we think of babies for all, for a long time as a blank slate, coming in without kind of an existing architecture or um, maybe even without biases. But research has shown us um, globally, research from Canada, from um, China, from the United States, especially at the Yale Baby Lab, They've explored what it is that babies kind of see the world through a lens that is ancient and old and part of the way that we have evolved. As human beings, we are very social creatures. We have um, evolved an entire slew of mechanisms, both neural, hormonal, cellular, and genetic to support 
our being able to be in connection and relationships with one another. But the interesting thing about this is that through our evolution, there's also been a secondary kind of system that evolves, which not only is around connection, but also around trustworthiness and um, who we are letting into our group. And so this is called sometimes in-group, out-group bias. And so babies, you know, as early as three months old, um, show a preference for certain things. So babies at three months show a preference for the language of their caregivers. And by six months, they show a preference for the physical characteristics of their caregivers. And so they begin to associate who is part of my village, my community, my group, my people. And this is, you know, partially an evolutionary process that allows us to make a quick decision about who we trust and who we let in versus who we hold a boundary with. And so this is something that um, we have documented and seen. And also babies have an interesting bias that um, is also a part and play with adults in that we have a preference for people who are more like us. And even if this person uh, with children is a person who has the same favorite color, likes the same snack, likes the same um, uh, you know, puppets, that there's a kinship that babies have with people who are similar. But out of the Yale Baby Lab, what we also start to discover is babies also have um, a bias to seeing people punished who are not like them. And so this rudimentary, rudimentary sense of justice and belonging is present even in our youngest, youngest learners. And so here's kind of a great layout when we think about um, the racial and um, development of identity with babies. And so, you know, at zero to one years old, babies look equally at all faces at birth, but at three months, they begin to look more closely at those that match their caregivers. And then when we see at two years old, um, children use race as a way to reason about people's behaviors. And then we see two to five that most children choose um, playmates who are of the same race and by um, four to five, expressions of racial prejudice begin to emerge. And by five years old, um, Black and Latinx children, this is interesting because the research shows that there is not a preference toward their own race or identity um, over another's. However, that white children at this age are more likely to be strongly biased towards and in favor of whiteness. And so when we think about popular culture and a lot of the images that um, our media is saturated with, it makes sense that children will see this and also internalize it to some degree. Um, by five years old, kindergartners show many of the same racial attitudes held by adults in our culture. We have learned to associate some groups with greater power and higher status um, than other groups. And by five to seven, explicit conversations um, about interracial friendships can dramatically improve racial attitudes um, in as little as a single week. And so these are, um, it's, it's powerful to think about what our children as, as it's better to think of your children as social scientists who are constantly observing our culture, our behaviors, our attitudes, and the ways that we interact with one another. And they're absorbing these messages. And we as caregivers and parents and caring educators have a real opportunity to disrupt at every stage of this development um, some of these, these concepts that are growing in our children. And so one of the things I love to point to and point out is the power of stories as a bridge. So these bridging stories, these are ways that we can connect belonging um, and this with, with every text and every book that we bring home and read with our children. The things we wanna focus on in every story is centering humanity and centering connection and centering belonging. And this looks like everyone wants to be seen for their gifts. And everyone wants to be seen for their talent. That all of us want the opportunities to pursue our dreams, and that all of us want to be safe and healthy and connected to our community. And so these are through lines that you can use with, with every text that you introduce in every story in every film to have a conversation about what is our shared values, what are our shared beliefs. And this um, I just have a couple of examples of some books and I'll just talk a little bit about some of the titles that I find to be really powerful. First, I wanna talk about 
When we think about the way that our society is constructed, there are some folks who find themselves in this crucible of kind of interlocking um, oppressions, right? So when we think about, um, in Sesame Street did this beautiful uh, research study around families, around culture and identity, and they interviewed around 6,000 um, children and parents about their experiences uh, through a racial lens. And what they found is that Muslim children especially had heard within a week negative um, comments about their, um, their religious identity and about their cultural identity. And so when we think about who is impacted, I think it's powerful to center at the center of our, of our bridging work, some of those communities that are, that are enduring some of the um, impacts of you know, some of these stereotypes and how that's showing up for children. Um, I also think it's important to mention too that you know, othering and belonging both have consequences. When we feel connected, we are literally rewarded through um, the neurotransmitters in our brain. We, we literally get this rush of happy hormones through our, um, our brain and our body saying, you belong, you're a part of the group, you're connected, I care about you. But othering, when we create a situation where a child feels that they are um, being judged, being uh, excluded, that actually causes um, a pain reaction because what happens is your brain is so efficient that it is processing um, both physical and social pain through the same pain receptors. And, and that is triggering for a, a chemical release in the body that says we are, we are not, we are being excluded. And that in an evolutionary sense has ramifications. So even, um, as our ancestors, if you were excluded from the group, that might put you at risk for greater attack and not. And so, so things like loneliness and things like social isolation is actually a warning system in our brain to say, get back to the group, get connected, find your, find your group, get back into the network. So I think, you know, when we think about, this is a beautiful story, The Proudest Blue. Um, and it's a girl kind of, you know, thinking about her family and how they wear the hijab and just like, what that means for them. And she sees her sister as this beautiful um, role model in her life. She sees all the people in her community through their strengths. And then even when she starts to experience some of the othering in the story, she leans on the strength of her community and she leans on the strength of those around her to navigate that. So a great story. All Because You Matter is similar. All Because You Matter says, you know, to these, this little boy, it's like a letter from a mother to her son saying, you know, I know there are times in, in your life where you're not going to feel like people see you for all of the good things about you, but I want you to know that you matter, that, that the universe, that the divine has, has brought you into this world and you have such a gift to give. So don't, um, you know, it's kind of like, don't take those messages to heart. Know that you have, um, you belong and you matter and you're going to do great things in this world. Um, Ladder to the Moon, I feel like I read this to my daughter more for myself than for her, because in this story, it is about a little girl whose grandmother has passed away. And the little girl, um, her, she never really got to meet her. And so her mother says to her, I wish you would have met your grandmother. You're so much like her. And so in the night, the little girl, this ladder comes down from heaven and her grandmother comes to pay her a visit. And in this visit, she carries her up to the moon and they look out onto the world and every time the grandmother hears suffering, maybe it's a flood or maybe it's a fire or maybe it's some, something happening on earth. She rushes down her ladder from the moon and gathers up the children and carries them to the moon. And it's just a beautiful story, but it's a reminder that one, our ancestors matter. Two, we're part of a heritage that um, is, is always an impetus for us to do and live out um, you know, our 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 purpose, right? So in this story, um, at the end of the evening, she brings her home and her little girl wakes up and goes to her mother and says, I see now why grandma was so special to you. So again, this brings and affirms for children that all of our families care about the same things. Our, our grandparents matter to us. Um, here at Julian at the wedding, this book just gives me goosebumps because in this story, Julian is a gender expansive child, you know, exploring uh, who his identity is. And, and so in this story, it centers um, some of our students who um, are exploring, you know, their identities and their gender identities. And it's just beautiful art, beautifully affirming. 
it's a great way to introduce this conversation to your children and the story that they will smile through just because of the incredible artwork um, by Jessica Love. And thank you, Omo, is about, you know, um, the story, this little boy's grandmother, she is making this soup and everyone from the community has been smelling it. So everyone's coming over to the house. And again, it is about bridging and about our role in community and for one another. So just some stories to model the power of that. Um, I'll also say that one of the other really great ways to do some of this bridging work is to think about um, your children's interests. So as an educator, you know, there, I taught little ones for a very long time. Dinosaurs are usually a passion and a, and a curiosity early on. This is a great way to um, celebrate your child's interests, but also bring in experts, let them see people who share that interest, who come from different backgrounds and cultural identities so that they can see that as well reflected. Um, I think about sharks and, and one of the things I like to do is when you wanna talk about a topic like stereotypes, Sometimes you can talk, introduce this with our youngest learners through what are some stereotypes that sharks have? How do people perceive sharks? How do people perceive um, women as scientists? So you can do some bridging here. Um, Dr. Eugenie Clark was also a biracial scientist. Her mother, um, she was Asian and white. And so in some of the books, you'll see pictures of her mother in you know, traditional attire. And it just is a great way for children to uh, you see it in an immersive way that people have multiple identities and intersectional identities. Um, and last, I'll say too, it matters that, you know, one of the things we do in Denver Public Schools is we also have, um, you know, dads, we center Black fathers, so we have a Black dad story time and book club. And in this beautiful space, um, it's open to everyone, everyone comes and one of the dads chose the book Hair Love. And after he read the book Hair Love, he said, everybody, tell me what you love about your hair. And kids were loving all of the colors and curls and shapes and, and, and ways their hair, um, you know, shapes their identity. And to hear the children connecting and celebrating each other in that space. Um, again, we had a father who's a, who cooks and he was cooking for his grandmother a soup. And children were able to say, wow, like, these relationships are like my relationships in my family, um, gardening and cooking and doing all these wonderful things. And then I have a resource just, you know, sometimes families will say that it's challenging to find some of these diverse books, um, which, you know, is a real concern, a real issue because publishing itself, the publishing world is really leaning in to do more and to create more representation across identities. But I'm just sharing a couple of, Instagram, um, you know, book bloggers that I love and I just get so much life when I go visit. So one is Here We Read and she's a mother and she has, um, you know, a, a wonderful uh, array of books that she's recommending. Read Your World, um, White Girl Learning, who I love because she's modeling this journey that she's taking through, um, you know, uh, diverse books and understanding different um, perspectives in the world. And Last, the Brown Bookshelf team of educators who have a wonderful um, uh, Instagram as well. And then just some strategies to keep in mind, you know, sharing culturally affirming and inclusive stories and inviting readers. So inviting, and, and this is something you could, you know, uplift to a teacher to say, you know, how can we have more, more readers and more book talks from people from our community, whether it's your school community, maybe it is your, um, scientific community, uh, wherever you can lean in and be an activist in that way to say, I would love to see um, us creating a space where diverse uh, uh, readers are brought in. Also to ensure that children have a positive interaction with people of different backgrounds. Um, I personally think that this is where classes can make a difference. So if you are, if your child's interested in a dance class, for example, maybe you reach out to Cleo Parker Robinson and, and engage them in a once a month or twice a month drumming and dance class, or maybe, you know, they're interested in um, a science uh, and they want to do some experiments, reaching out to the students of color. Um, there's a science group that does experiments. And this puts them in a place where the bridging will take place because there's a shared interest. There is a shared, um, uh, you know, curiosity. And that is beautiful, but it's also that the teachers, they're seeing people in positions where they're 
teaching classes who come from different backgrounds. That part is um, powerful as well. And then teaching children that people are all individuals and that we all have very different backgrounds, but get to know me as an individual. And that is when you can see, you know, that salubona come through where we can be showing each other our true selves and um, building some authentic experiences. And then using connection and belonging to bridge children to communities along shared values and that all of those shared values show up. So even when, you know, biases creep up when we are both time pressed and have to make a snap judgment. So pausing to ask yourself first, where, where is there might be commonality? Where might there be an opportunity to see more of this individual than what is just being put before me um, in this very um, short amount of time or this place? So those are just, you know, I wanted to keep it short because I wanna have time for us to have some conversation, but uh, so I'll stop sharing there. And just you know, open it up because I know that there's comments in the chat and that you have some questions as well, Jennifer. Yeah, Janet, that's amazing. All of those books and you know, thinking about just how beautiful those books are. And you know, I have teenagers, so for me, I almost feel like I've missed that boat at this point. Um, so you know, as we're all coming here from different points along this journey um, of sort of having these conversations around race. Can you talk about what that looks like, you know, for sort of navigating those conversations, maybe with colleagues or, or friends or even family, um, because we're all coming from somewhere else along this journey. So how does, what does that look like and how, how can you help us navigate some of that? Well, I think the first thing and the most powerful thing is that we have to show up with some grace, grace for ourselves and grace for one another. And I say that because all of our journeys start in different places and all of our journeys, you know, we're a big part of it is self-reflective, right? We, there are folks who, you know, are really passionate about reading different books that are anti-bias, anti-racist. And that is, that's incredible. That's a great place to engage and build your praxis, right? And by praxis, I mean the way that you take your beliefs and put them into action in the world. So for some people, that's where they're dipping their toe in, right? They're they, they may have come from a community or um, they may have grown up in a space where they didn't have a lot of authentic relationship and interaction with people of very many different backgrounds. You know, personally, I grew up in the military. My father, we lived in, in bases from Panama and Korea and Germany. So for my bridging work is different, right? I, I, I think that one of the things we have to do is accept that one another, that we are all on a journey and that we are, um, introspective and holding ourselves kind of accountable to showing up in integrity in that journey. So I think, you know, when you talk about some of our high schoolers, I mean, they are witnesses to an incredible amount of history being made just in the last, you know, at this moment in time in the last few years. And I think to be brave enough to say, tell me what you're thinking. Tell me how this is landing with you. Tell me what your perspective is on these these events on this moment in history, because what we want to do is, you know, create a loop of self-reflection and a pause. The pause, you know, what they've shown is that people who practice mindfulness actually reduce their biases um, significantly. And so part of it is because these heuristics, these um, biases are, are the brain's way of doing a shortcut. It's saying there is so much cognitive load I need to make a decision really quickly. What are the, the, what's the information that I have? And then it rapidly finds like a sticky note and sticks it there. And that usually is either a stereotype or a biases, right? Or a bias. And so if we simply pause and ask ourselves, what, what is, what am I really seeing? What is the information being provided? Is this authentic to what I know in my lived experience? Is this, um, you know, is this something that is being used to elicit a really strong emotional response from me? And is that true? So I think this process of just engaging in those conversations, no matter what age our children are, and just holding them to, um, to challenge those, to interrogate those and to see where they come from. Kind of a follow-up on that along the lines of bias. How do we, um, how do we acknowledge our own you know, bias as we're, teaching our children or having conversations with family members, um, 
think what, what are some techniques that we can use in addition to maybe that pause and um, being more mindful? Some well, techniques that I, would help us. I think that, you know, um, there's, I think it's Dr. Dina Simmons who talks about, um, you know, just thinking about where they come from, but also, you know, there's work around the archeology span of self. And I think that's Dr. Yolanda, her last name's escaping me, but um, she talks about thinking about where all of these structures were built in us. So for example, if I know that growing up, I was given a lot of messages that were negative about a group or community or, um, so I have to first hold and say that I come to this space with, um, some preconceived notions that, that were given to me. This is an inheritance that I uh, was given to me from you know, generations before me. And so first recognizing that we have baggage around it, right? The second is to acknowledge our own racial anxiety. So some of these conversations were so emotionally charged when we were children. So remember like there was a time where people said, oh my God, don't point out that people have different, they're, coming, like, they're different shades. Don't point out that someone's darker skin. Don't point out that someone is lighter skin. Don't, don't mention skin color, right? That was that age of color blindness, you know? Mm -hmm. And God forbid that you said in a store, like, look, mommy, her hair is in braids or, or what have you. You know, your parent was like, oh, you know? So that racial anxiety is real. And we have to give ourselves self-compassion around that and say, you know, this is something I carry. This is something I learned and then I am working to unlearn, right? And that um, none of us are walking in, in as experts in that. There are things that are evolving and that are um, identities that are showing themselves and people are finally being able to walk in the fullness of who they are. And that brings up a lot of that historical, like, you know, that lessons that don't serve us. And so it is about to, um, what we transmit and what we don't want to transmit anymore. So if we don't want to transmit the racial anxiety anymore, we have to walk in some authenticity around that too. So when we read a book to our child and we say, you know, this book is like really important to me because it's like, I didn't really have this when I was growing up and I'm so happy to see it now. So, you know, and, and to share those stories with our children because it lets them know that I'm not, I'm not um, saying one thing and doing another. So sometimes we say, this is really important and we should read this as a family. And they can see that our body language is like, we're tight. We, we kind of are nervous about doing it. And they're like, why are you telling me this mixed message? What's really going on here? And so I think the more we can just be authentic with our children to say, hey, the whole family, we're all on a journey with this. We all have not been equipped right for this journey, but we're, we're doing our best and we want to, to, we want to be better at it every day. That's great. Thank you for, for that. I, I want to be taking notes, but I also want to just pay attention and like let it all soak in. Um, looks like we have a question in the chat and I'm going to try to multitask here. Um, let's see. So I'm just going to read something from the chat. Does that feel okay? Uh, so looks like we have um, a participant wrote in, both sets of grandparents for my kids have weathered very hard times as homesteaders dealing with the dust bowls of the 1930s and 50s, droughts, et cetera. What are tools to explain that as white people, we've been privileged despite that hardship? Um, and is there a word that can be substituted for privilege? So what, what do you think about that one? Well, I think first I would ask myself, what comes up for me when I hear the word privilege? Mm. And I think that that is interesting because I think we enter into a space where when we think about families and the journey of every family to overcome obstacles, it is really rooted in our society that we have an, an idea about pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps. But this is a really core identity around being an American that you know, wherever you drop us, we will thrive and survive, right? And at the same time, you know, there is this realization that there are communities that have truly, um, they have truly experienced a very different reality, even in the midst of that, that oppression, right? So the Dust Bowl, you know, when we think about all of these families that um, food scarcity, when we think of the 
trauma of not being able to provide for your children. Um, my husband's uh, grandparents also, um, you know, they, it, it, they remember growing up in that time. And so it, it showed up in the things they did even later, you know, they would wash aluminum foil. I mean, it was just like, you know, it was a part of their being. I think everyone who kind of comes through that time in that period, their parents were really raised to appreciate every small thing. And so I think what we say is that, you know, even in this time when there was so much, the nation was going through such a period of turmoil, who also in that crucible was, was also being undermined even as they were trying to move forward. So when I think about that, I think about families who um, were, were not given loans and not given opportunities to buy homes in certain communities. So, you know, when we open up that space of compassion, it is not to say that um, a group that, you know, endured the same instances, the same experiences are less than for it. It is to say, and still look at how these systems continue to interlock so that they could continue to permanently hold a group in a state of permanent um, and perpetual oppression, right? And when we reckon with that, we can see and say, wow, so to, to affirm that as, a, as a true and a, an experience that people have had, and to also say it doesn't diminish, um, it doesn't diminish me to acknowledge that. Okay, great. Thank you for, for that. Thank you for that question. That was really good. Thank you. Yeah, and we would love we would love for folks in the community to um, to put their put their questions into the chat. Um, so here's um, let's see. I see a lot too on the on Jamboard. Oh yeah, I'm trying yeah, to track so, of all all my screens here. No, you're fine. Why don't I just real quick? I'll just share the screen yeah. of the Jamboard. Um, Thank you so much for, for engaging here. Um, and so what I love about the Jamboard is that, you know, we can um, just kind of look and I'm gonna make some of these, if you don't mind, I'm gonna make some of these a little bit bigger so we can see them. So our hopes and wishes are they recognize the differences in people and the uniqueness and to be able to honor them and know we're all human beings and they recognize injustice in their lives and work to make it right or to change that injustice. That I, I well, I want to throw a heart. I want to just use my pen real quick and just heart this because um, that, right, our hope and our dream is that our children feel so rooted in ideas of justice and belonging that they are able to stand up and be an upstander when they see these injustices playing out in the world. Um, and I think about, you know, one of the things that um, Dr. Um, John A. Powell, who I, I love, I love Dr. John A. Powell. So he is with the Belonging and Othering Institute. And one of the things he talks about is that when we have um, created a system of othering that is so deeply entrenched that children feel though as though they have to um, protect a space from people who are different. So when we think about folks who have called the police on a, a, a man birding in Central Park or a family barbecuing in Oakland, they have seen so often in their life that people of color do not belong in certain spaces that, that they feel as though they have to police or hold that space as um, separate. And so, you know, cognitively, when we think about that, that's heartbreaking because, you know, how can we truly be citizens of the world and engaged with our fellow humanity and doing this deep work if, if that is the mindset that we have entrenched in our children? So I, I love that. Um, let me see if we have anything on the challenges. So ah, an artistic family and empathy is not an easy, um, it's not easy for a couple of us. Also one child is very contrary, doesn't want to be told how to interact with others. Um, you know, there are, I think, you know, I think, I think a couple things, you know, I think that one is that as a, as a culture and a society, there's a lot more that we can do for our differently abled community to show up and show, um, just to make sure that spaces are inclusive and welcoming and that um, that's another area where biases can, can start early and young because of the ways that schools are structured so that um, classrooms are not inclusive in the ways that they should be. And so I think that that is when um, 
that is when sometimes too, just having some of those like classes where maybe it is that, um, you know, finding an art class that's specific, specifically geared and supportive, or um, I think about some of the, uh, we can't do it during COVID, but events that were um, especially to support students um, who have autism, just, you know, that's a journey, right? Like we wanna make sure that um, our kids are showing up with the skills to build community. But I do think that, you know, the authentic spaces for them to build their own relationships because when a student cares about another student and they have that opportunity to have some shared experiences and authentic relationships, that's where you see the really um, powerful connections that are made that inform their identity racially. Um, police brutality, very tough topic, very tough topic to talk about. Um, I'm gonna, there's a book that I love to recommend. Let me see if this is um, uh, one that's in our, I have a, a digital library collection. There's a book, um, Stop sharing for just a second. Um, and it's called um, something, not something, there's a book called Something Happened in Our Town, but that's not the one I'm thinking of. Um, oh, Breaking News. Let me see. So the book is called Breaking News. Let me see if I can find it in our, my set here. Um, but what I love about Breaking News is they don't tell you as you're reading the story um, exactly what happened, but it's kind of like, uh, yeah, I'll show you this cover real quick. Um, so in the story, Breaking News, and the cover looks uh, just like this. And so the little girl and little boy, they're at home and they're having fun with their family. And all of a sudden the news comes on and the family goes and sits in front of it and their faces become drawn and sad. And you don't know what's happened, but everyone starts to carry this sadness. And the little girl goes to school and the people on the bus are sad about it. In her school, they're sad about it. When she comes home, she thinks, what is it that I can do? And so she begins to start with one little thing and her one little thing was to plant a flower. And then she begins to grow this flower. And then she starts this small little, um, kind of like a little community garden in front of her building. And it's about how one action in the right direction and how we can, every, everyone has a capacity to do healing, right? Everyone has a capacity to heal through our words, through our actions. Um, there's even uh, a beautiful article about the invisible mending of art and how even this conversation we're engaging in is part of this kind of knitting together back our community. Once things have been torn asunder, that we can actually each be a force in knitting communities back together through those words, those actions, those beliefs. Um, and so I will just, I'll stop sharing that briefly, but um, again, another beautiful bridging story. And I popped a link into chat um, for if you want to check it out from the Jeffco Public Library if you have a card. Um, so thank you for sharing that one. Yeah, there was a lot on that um, on that Jamboard page about kind of looking at those barriers. Uh, there was one question about you know how do you um, how do you talk with your children? So here's one. Um, a uh, person works at Mize, they have a 12 year old son, want to be able to talk with my son about race in the context of the Denver area, which compared to New York state, which is, I'm from New York, so I'm familiar with this, is a, just not as diverse, right? It's, uh, so how do, we, how do we engage in those conversations when, it's, um, when it is sort of not as, as evident as in other areas? Right, right. So I, I think this is this challenge, right? Like, I'll just be honest and transparent, you know, growing up, I was very much in uh, very diverse communities. Um, and the first, so I was living in, we were, when I was little, we were living in Panama. And, um, you know, in the military, you can't choose who your neighbors are. Everybody gets assigned housing and you live where you live and that's just it. So we lived on this beautiful little hill in Panama that was surrounded by the rainforest. And um, we had neighbors move in who got assigned to that housing. And one of the first things they did was they put up the Confederate flag in their garage. And <laughs> my dad is from Texas, my mom is Korean. And um, so we didn't know any better. So we were kind of hanging out by this house because it had a mango tree that grew in front of their house. So that was the house we all went to anyway, all summer long to get mangoes. And my dad recognized that there was gonna be an issue. And so he went over to the neighbor's house and invited their dad to play tech, um, flag football. All the dads would get together and play football. And so over time, my dad just kept building relationships and um, that relationship paid off in that the, the Confederate flag came down 
And we were all able like, to hang out in this mango tree. And he had two sons. One was Randy and one was Jim Bob. And by the end of that summer, like we all played together. We all just enjoyed together. But that was in my mind as this bridging. My father introduced me to bridging early on. And so when coming to the United back to the United States, I was in high school. And it was the first time I saw such segregated communities. And so here, you know, when we think about it, Denver is there, there you know, we self-organize because of some of that in-group, out-group, and because of some of that bias that we have towards people who, you know, look like us, may, you know, have shared, um, a, a sense of a shared identity as, as people do. And so it is challenging, but at the same time, it's when we have to really deepen our commitment to it. So if this is something that there's this commitment to, it's saying that, you know, I know that we live in an area and in a community where you don't always get to go to school and always have to get to have some of these opportunities. So as a family, we just have a commitment to doing and engaging in some um, events that celebrate, you know, diversity that we want to attend and support. And, you know, even to, to support black owned businesses or, or Latinx businesses or um, Asian businesses to go and make it a point to, um, visit and shop in some of these grocery stores, shop in, and, and pick up some of these, um, you know, meals from restaurants, because you can't build a relationship where there's no opportunity for connection. And in spaces where that opportunity is limited, it just means we have to be more intentional. And what you'll find is that the benefits and blessings for your kids see you modeling, like my father modeled for me. Um, it becomes a part of what we're transmitting to our kids, right? We can only transmit what we contain. So until we are modeling and showing them that, um, that is what's gonna come through and they'll see that. And kids, like I said, really recognize, you know, I think James Baldwin has this beautiful quote, um, I can't hear what you say because I see what you do. And kids mm -hmm. are doing that to us. They're watching us and seeing what we do and how we handle situations. And um, it will be fruitful. So there was another question in chat, um, and let me see if I can get this correctly here. So um, Demetrius says he um, grew up in DC where the majority of people were black at that time. I have lived in DC too, so I'm familiar with, I moved from DC here and that was a big, that was a big shift <laughs> for sure. Um, so uh, now I raised my son of color where the majority of people are white. Um, how do I have a conversation around why there is Black History Month or why um, gums are darker, why some gums are darker than others? So just mm -hmm. some of these more difficult questions probably to navigate with um, raising, raising a son of color. Yeah. Yes and no. So, so I love that, you know, this child is like, let me ask you all of these questions because that's authentic to kids, right? They're so curious. And what we can do is say, yeah, there's tons of differences. There's to explore all of the beauty and amazing differences of people and to really uplift that, to say, there are people who are so beautifully melanated that they come in shades. Like when we look at, you know, beautiful models from the Sudan, when we look at, you know, all of the, the, the true human diversity, right? And we think about that is to, to acknowledge and say, yeah, because, because people are different because people are different. And it's, and, you know, Audre Lorde talks about, it's, it's the power of recognizing it's not our differences that sow division. It's how we prioritize and, and we associate power. We connect power to the differences. So one of the key conversations for all of us to begin with is the constructs of power and how they play out. And if we can teach our children to have some metacognition about who is being given power and who is having power taken away? Who has agency and who does not? That is praxis. And, and again, I come back to praxis because it is the practice of how we make our beliefs and action. And until we internalize that for our kids, you know, um, we won't see the benefit. And, and I'll share a quote. My mother is Korean and she has this, there's a saying in Korea, don't tie your children's shoes here because when you are in heaven, they will ask you to untie them. And so it is about what we teach our children to do and how to engage in the world is much more powerful than, than us teaching them to follow our lead and do what we say and 
to be obedient in a system. It is that sometimes they will have to transgress against that system because that is what activism and that is what social justice means. Is Social justice means we look at a system and we ask, we interrogate it to ensure that it is being just, that it is serving the needs of all people. And so when you have that praxis, there are spaces that I show up that are black centering spaces, but what I might show up with and interrogate is how are we addressing our, our folks who speak other languages? How are we addressing um, our gender expansive community? So those pieces, we, we always have to have that praxis. I just, um, so Demetrius wanted to add in that um, his son is five. So um, that's beautiful. Just, yes. Yeah, give you some context yes. there. Um, and, and again, just coming back to baby, everybody's different. And you know what? Those are just some of the differences we can see that they, that people are different even in ways we can't see. That sometimes, you know, we think, and that's why stories are really important because stories will bring this up um, for, for five-year-olds especially. Um, and, and five-year-olds can, you know, they, I, I really will say, children have a strong sense of justice, right? As long as we're empowering it and nurturing it, you know, they can say when something's fair and something's not fair. And, you know, my kids, I have a, a nine year, I have a, well, she just turned 10. So I have a 10, a 14, and I have a much older daughter. But I, I wanted, at one time when she was five or six, I wanted her to watch um, uh, Lady and the Tramp. Because that was one of my favorite video, like Disney movies when I was a kid. And the first thing she comes into the kitchen and she says, mommy, why are they, why are they, why is it depict, you know, the, the Asian, the, the Siamese kitties, why are they singing like that? I don't think that's respectful. You know, and so I didn't have to teach her that. I, we talk about equity and, and those things, but she, in her own discernment, was able to call that out. And I, as an adult, was so enamored of that movie that I didn't even see it until she like held me accountable. Like, so he, oh, sorry. <laughs> so here's a question, kind of along those lines of you know that that kids often. Um, are, they pick up on a lot of those things, maybe before we do. But how do you um, how do you have a gentle conversation with a child who makes an insensitive remark about someone else and about their race? Like how how do you how do you start that conversation? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So one of the things I think of is you know especially when a child makes a comment that you feel like um, it's not something they heard at home, right? So when they're, they're hearing it at home, you know where they're getting it from. But there's sometimes you know children when in that Sesame Street study where they're talking about race with children, what they found is that adults, like more than 50% of adults are not talking to children about race. And then more than like 60% of educators are not talking to children explicitly about race. So when no one is talking to the children explicitly about race, they're teaching each other. And so when children are out in the world and they come home and they're like, you know, this, this person, I don't like them because they're this. I don't like them because of this. or um, they're bad, they're bad people. What we have to realize is that one, to pause and say, where did you hear that? Like, where is that coming from, right? Because then, you know, it helps them to, to, to say, well, you know, some of my friends are saying this. And then what we can do is pause and say, you know, honey, sometimes people say things about other people that are not true. And I want us to think about in our family, you know, how that would feel if someone said that about someone you love and you care about. Because, you know, for kids sometimes unpacking, um, you know, all of the, the social justice in the world is not is hard. But when they think about people they love and how people they love, they wanna have them treated. That's when we can come back to those through lines, right? Everyone wants to be safe. Everyone wants to be seen for their gifts. Everyone wants to be seen in a positive way. and. We need to also pause for them to say, we, you know, we look at every individual as a person we meet, and that way we can get to know them. But we don't judge whole communities and whole groups of people and do those things because that's where, and you know, introducing a term like racism, I mean, introducing a term to say, this is why some things happen to to different people because people carry a belief that's not good about them. So I want you to always remember, and it's like going back to the golden rule to some extent, we treat people how we wanna be treated and treat people how you want your dad and your mom and your sister and your brother and your cousin to be treated. And that's with respect, right? So um, I think we, we, we 
sometimes we can pause and think about, you know, that we want to do this in a loving way because we want them to come back to us when other questions come up. But we want to lean in and give them a, a language for it, a language that includes words like power and justice and, um, you know, equality and respect. Following up on that, there was a question in the chat. Um, Bobby has a five-year-old biracial grandson who is very loving. And how do um, I support him when others hurt him due to race? So kind of a similar, but from the yes. other side. Yes, and this is important because what happens, again, going back to what I mentioned about pain. So, you know, that we process social pain and physical pain through those same kind of neural um, receptors. And so what you wanna do is remind and honor the fact that I know that hurt. And I know that sometimes people may say hurtful things, but you wanna connect it back to when who we are in the world, we get to define that, right? So we're thinking about children of color need to have a lot of positive and affirming stories, images and um, uh, modeling, right? So there's a term around enabling text. So an enabling text is different from an affirming text in that enabling text show a child that challenge is gonna come, that they will be challenged in different ways, right? So, you know, when we think about showing and reading stories about historic figures that have overcome adversity, enabling texts provide a roadmap. And what they do is they say two things. They say challenge will come. And that's important for children of color because we have not eradicated injustice in our society. So they will face injustice. But what it does is provide this roadmap and this architecture around you will overcome it because of who you are and because of your, your lineage and your strength that's in you because your family and your love and your heart. And that's an important message. And it's also important to teach a bit of criticality about what students or children are consuming. So not always, but you want to kind of think about curating um, the, the artwork, the, the music, the um, books and stories and images that they are ingesting because things become a part of us, right? Like it's, um, it's important to think about those kinds of enabling text and enabling images as a protective factor, as a protective layer um, for children who walk in the world but also being honest that says, you know, there are things in this world that you may have to face, but know that you're strong enough to face them. This is important for also children who are being taught to be upstanders, that they know that it is, when you stand up for someone, you are engaging in a struggle that's an old struggle around equality and justice. And that is a good thing. And that is hard sometimes because we're in a society that teaches us to avoid sometimes confrontation and conflict. We're conflict avoidant. So things do come up for us when we are standing our ground and getting rooted. But those modeling of stories of people coming together as abolitionists, as the Underground Railroad, as people who care. And, and we have so many beautiful examples of this in our history, but we do not uplift it. And that's so interesting and so sad at the same time is that we have, you know, the whole Underground Railroad, right? Like we have people who cared, abolitionists who cared, and they didn't do it perfectly all the time, but they engaged and they put themselves at risk for people to have um, equality and opportunity. And so uplifting those stories for our children gives them a roadmap that says, people have done this before you and you can do this. Cool. All right, let's see, check in the chat. Remember, please use the chat if you have um, particular questions you'd like to ask Janet. We can also pop over to, um, to our Jam yeah, I, can, I can show um, a, a page of our Jam board. Mm -hmm. Let me real quick um, share my screen. And this question was, what are examples of ways your family explores race, culture, and identity now? And um, Someone said, my, my kids attend a dual language, dual literacy, multicultural, English and Spanish school. I love that because, you know, that is, you know, when we become bilingual and we speak more than one language, think of the world that, that offers us to be connected. Mm -hmm. um, I've been reading um, books to my kids that introduce positive thoughts about people of other races. I've also been reading books myself to learn from 
different authors of color. This is important because, you know, stories and reading and reading novels especially, they actually do impact the way that our brains, um, the architecture of our brain, right? So one is that when we're reading a book, our brain is actually sending out all of this um, beautiful mix of, of neurochemicals and transmitters that are making us feel a part of that story. So it is like stepping in, you know, as Dr. Rudine Sims Bishops talks about is those books are windows, mirrors and sliding glass doors and we can have more compassion and empathy. So the biggest return on investment is reading those novels by different um, lenses and perspectives and backgrounds because they increase our capacity for empathy. There's a beautiful study called, it was a, um, there were two professors, well, one was a professor and one was a judge, um, and they collaborated to do book clubs in prisons. And what they found was that they could reduce the recidivism rate for people to go back after, after these book clubs by, you know, 40%, you know, in their first year of doing this. And what they found was that hearing the inner dialogue of a character filled in and provided um, the, the, the folks in this program with understanding how their actions impact another human being. And so in reading these books, you know, we recognize that um, it increases our capacity for empathy. Um, we talk about each person in our family and our friends look different and every one of us is a different type and role model. I love it. I read books by BIPOC authors, watch stories, and discuss what's happening in the news. I, you know, that's, I love that. So those are all powerful. And then I'll just click over one more page. Um, you know, breaking the status quo can be challenging. What motivates you to rise to the occasion? Fairness, my faith, um, these obvious injustice. I want a better world for my kid. I love faith and I love where they placed faith, right? Like right here in between, like, and systemic issues that are perpetuate a cycle of racism. Um, let me use my pointer. Um, this one, the desire to make the world better for my children so they don't experience what I have and, and what I have seen, and that is powerful motivator for us to do differently. Um, and what are some resources you need to help you on the journey? A framework, a paradigm, books, language to teach my kids to have conversations um, with extended family in rural non-diverse areas. I think this is really hard, is when you have family members who might be saying or doing things um, that go against the values that you hold as a family. And, you know, that's where you're kind of teaching your children two lessons, right? You're teaching them one is we stand on our values. Um, I also think that it is powerful to also talk to your children that not everyone's going to believe the same things we believe. And people we love might believe things that we don't believe as well. And so letting them know that the world is not always going to be in sitting in agreement and that, um, but you don't want to teach them to look for conflict. You want to teach them that conflict is a part of human relationship and that they can set boundaries. Right? Um, perfect. And then, okay, so that's, so I'm going to stop and sharing. I, I, I put the link um, to Jamboard back in there um, in the chat if folks want to want to access that. I want to share this one from Lisa. Uh, she writes, I'm watching this with my three-year-old and um, all he can spot are the similarities. Uh, I guess he said, mommy, you have black hair like she does and says so much hope. So that's, that was heartwarming. But I do wanna share this one too, because I think there's some, we can have some discussion around this. Um, this is from Kate. It says, people tell me that because I am white, it means that I am automatically racist. Is there some truth to that? That's a tough one. Okay, so, so I think that, well, two things. One, um, I think that there's some times where people have perhaps been harmed by a system and then there is a self-protective measure that comes in to say, you know, I don't want to engage in some of this bridge building and relationship building. Um, but the other piece I will say, so, so sometimes we can't control the actions of some folks who may walk in the world with some beliefs. And, you know, if they're willing to engage in conversation, I always tell people, if you're willing to engage in conversation, I am willing to engage in a conversation. Um, but the other piece around it is that we've come to a place where if we're not working to do better, then we're doing harm. And so by that, I mean that there's a space where we don't engage, where people can feel um, that it's not their struggle, nor their fight, and nor their uh, problem. And so in that, being a bystander is also by sheer not in 
it, it's it's kind of being a co-signer, right? So bystanding, and so when we see this is this is interesting because this is when we see that um, you know a lot of people during the summer when there was you know, such really terrifying and saddening and heartbreaking um, injustices around it, it, it awakened in people this need to um, re-examine where they stand, right? And so you saw people engaging in book clubs and readings and study and, and dialogue, right? But, you know, the thing is, is equity is a verb. Equity is action. We, we, there's a space where we have to engage and work to disrupt um, and so things that we want to think about is I tell people all the time, it's like, I can talk to you all day about riding a bicycle. I can read all the books in the world about riding a bicycle, but it won't take you but 30 seconds to see me on a bicycle to know whether or not I can ride a bike. Yeah. Right. And so we can talk about equity and we can read about equity. And then when the moment comes where we have to stand on equity, it's going to be apparent, right, where we really are. So that's why authenticity and being honest is really important part of the dialogue is to say, you know, and to show up with that, that cultural humility to say, I don't know exactly if I am doing all the things that I could be doing in this moment, but I want to do more and I want to engage and I want to be supportive. So whether it looks like you're sitting in a, um, a meeting and someone has um, interrupted or not allowed a colleague of color or a colleague that's differently abled or a colleague that is from another country to speak up or to uh, engage, then you advocate and you defer and you say, you know, I would really love to hear from my colleague who, you know, hasn't been able to share in this space. When it comes to advocate for positions and roles, to share that with wide networks, to think about who is invited in and who is not. Um, and to think about, you know, Every, every small act is a ripple and it sets into motion this beautiful uh, synchronicity, you know, synchronicity of, of a response. So when we step out and stand on something, we inspire others to do the same. So it, it's really, I think, a powerful um, to, to recognize that people might, people might be you know, casting on to, to folks who um, have a genuine heart for the work a bias that doesn't feel good, right? But at the same time, we are in the, in the, the messiness of transforming a, a whole social construct. And, and so giving grace and allowing ourselves to have grace for ourselves to say, well, I want to not internalize that someone might not think that I am the best ally, but I just want to walk the walk in integrity with myself. You know, I want to just if we can stay in integrity, then I think that's the, that's the real work, right? Thank you. Thank you for that. All right, let's see. I think that's it in the chat. And we have about 15 minutes left. I want to make sure that if there are other questions that folks have for Janet, that um, please go ahead and put those into chat. Um, you know, if there, are, if there are other book titles that you would like to share, I can try to pull them up on our catalog too and drop them into, into the chat. But it's... Um, I'm on the phone. Am I able to ask a question? Yes, absolutely. Please do. Yeah, and I apologize if uh, this was already covered. Hopefully it's worth the repeat if it was. Um, my question is around um, creating that vocabulary for belonging and, and not othering. And um, I'd love your reflection on somebody once told me to um, use the phrase our black people or our Latinx populations. And I'd just love to understand um, whether that's okay. Um, are there other terms that would be better to create that sense of belonging and um, community when having conversations about race? Right. So personally, and I had to do this for myself because I always use our. <laughs> I, you know, and, and the thing about it is that using the possessive on a community, I challenged myself on that because, you know, it is creating a connection, right? But that connection is still in the possessive form. So I personally, um, I, I say our community, in community. So what I, I go back to is the Sawubona concept of, you know, for my, for my children, I say, you know, 
I want to, we want to support um, the Latinx community. We want to support our gender expansive community. Um, and then I see through the hour. Um, but it does for our children, I think, you know, whether or not they're using the hour, but I think identifying and specifically naming communities that experience some of the most othering. So to say to your children, just, you know, sometimes it's really hard for kids who are exploring their gender identity because sometimes they are bullied. And so if you see that happening, you want you to really let me know. And I want you to let your teacher know if you see that happening in your school or, you know, if you see that one of your classmates, you know, is sitting by themselves and they're often lonely or maybe they're, someone is bullied, you know, you want to talk to them kind of about the con, the, the, the world they're occupying, you know, because these things, we think they, we see them on a macrocosm, but they're happening on a microcosm every single day. And so I think it's really important to think about, um, you know, the, the terms are evolving, right? So some of the terms that we use and we teach our children, we want to let them know too that things are always um, subject to change and challenge. And so one of the things I think about is in the African-American community, I was at a school and one of the um, there was a, an educator there who wanted to talk to me about how the African, the black students were bullying the African American students, and I said, "Well, help me with that. I'm not, you know, I need. I'm not sure I understand." And so, in her mind, she's an African immigrant, and so for her, African American were the African students or students who had immigrated from Africa, and they were engaging with the black students who were born and perhaps and raised here. And so, you know even with the terms that we're uh, working with, you know, there are subject to evolving, right? In our lexicon. So I would say that we wanna support and have a community, everyone in our community, right? So you can say our community and, and that includes folks who are differently abled, folks who have body diversity and just celebrate it. I think when, when our children see us celebrating differences, it lets them know that differences are okay, right? And um, and yeah, so I think that is if that is useful to you. I hope is that I think for the youngest learners using our community, or you know, we want to celebrate everyone in our community. Lets them know that there's belonging for everyone, right? And so um, in my community, we have this beautiful family. Um, that loves to go on morning walks. And so I've spoken with them a few times and they're from Afghanistan. And um, the, the grandfathers from these three homes, they like to take a yoga mat and go and sit on the sidewalk, any random sidewalk and just have a gathering. And so, you know, every time I see them, I, tell, I always tell my children, I'm so glad they're here in, their, in our community. And I get to see them having this, um, this social moment. It just reminds me that they're safe in our community. And that's what I love to see. So if that's useful. Um, and then I saw another, I saw another question about, oh, thank you so much, Nancy. Um, okay, so Melanie and her question is, my future children will be biracial. What are some ways I can help them work through their identity when they're forced to check the box in their race section and uh, found too commonly on forms? Is there a multiracial, um, is there a way that multiracial can feel empowering instead of diluting? This is really important. So, you know, I'm also biracial and, um, you know, and uh, yes, and I see Tiffany, I see your question too. So one of the things is we want to make sure that children know that we're whole, that we're whole. So when I was growing up, what, a lot of the conversation was you're half. You're half this and you're half that, but you're not whole. And when what children are, they are complete in their identity as um, as, a, as a black woman, as a Korean woman, as a biracial woman, I'm a whole person. And so how I self-define and how I see myself through intersectionality, right? Audre Lorde, um, I always tell people when you really need some wisdom, turn to the Lord because Audre Lorde was a, um, a lesbian black woman. And when you think about the pressures on um, a, a person who sits at that intersectional identity, what is so abundant that comes out is that the power of connection and walking in your truth. So with little ones, it is really about allowing them to be fully participatory in all of the parts of their culture that make them who they are. So, 
you know, um, for me, my children, they do Afri we do an intergenerational African women's dance and drum ensemble. My children participate in that. My children also wear the handbook when they go to, you know, culture nights, depending on what they want to do. Um, my family is food fusion. My growing up, my mother, who is Korean, would do, you know, recipes from the African American tradition. My father used Korean uh, kimchi and seasoning. I, it was, we were, we lived in both of those worlds and walked in both of those realities. And it, um, we were never, you know, you, the, the box, you know, we were told, my parents said, pick whatever box you want to pick, you know what I mean? It's <laughs> your identity, it's not anyone else's identity. So I think that that is, um, that is powerful is just to make sure that they are, they don't fall into this idea that comes from blood quantum rules around you are this percentage of this. And I even know that um, just exploring that kind of conversation, especially from, you know, our uh, First Nations people and in our indigenous um, community to look at the, has that really served them, the, the blood quantum, um, and has that allowed people to really be fully participatory in their culture and agency? And I also saw another question about a white adoptive parent to a child of color. I've become more aware that there are many conversations around safety that I need to have with my child, a conversation that as a white individual, I might not have historical experience with um, things like what to do when you get pulled over and, um, and how to stay safe in public spaces where your behavior might be judged or misinterpreted. Um, I think this is probably one of the most difficult and I think a very painful conversation to recognize that, you know, in this relationship that's so rooted in love, that there's this reality that sometimes there are going to be, um, you're transgressing, right, against this entire societal uh, construct around race and identity and who belongs to one another, you know, to, so I think one of the things is, um, there is such power in deepening the cultural, the, the ability to be in relationship with the communities of color that children need to feel attached to. So I'm going to show, an, I'm just going to share an example in our um, Iwade, which is our, our intergenerational African women's drum and dance ensemble. There is a mother who is also white and her daughters um, are participatory and she brings them to all the gatherings and all the practices and rehearsals and um, was fully present and yet able to witness and hold space to say there are certain things that are being transmitted culturally that are, are not mine but are hers right like these are for these girls to be engaging in and receiving and so I think the harm comes in when the, the racial anxiety from the parent to go into fully um, cultural spaces they feel they don't belong there. So then they withhold the child from being there. And so I would encourage you to create those connections and connect the child as well to those bodies of community and to know and, and to risk, right? Like to risk being there and being the outsider in that space. Because um, I, I would love to say that you'd be accepted and welcomed and embraced in all of them, but you know, people are still, like I said, this is messy business, but to continue to show up in those spaces on behalf of the child, because um, you know, I have a friend, we did a documentary actually about being biracial and um, her name is Rebecca Henderson. And in those conversations and to see the documentary, I, as a biracial woman, um, really, it was hurtful to me to see the, the sadness and the grief from some of the parents who didn't allow their child to participate fully in that, in those cultural spaces, because the ways that there was internalized lack of, the self-concept was impacted and damaged from that. So, and, and I have a, a blog I do, it's called Mixed Mama, and I do like, it's a multiracial motherhood blog, and it um, it's like, you know, on Facebook or, or what have you, but. I try to share cultural events and community events that people can join into because I do believe in the power of bridging. And so um, I think we have to support each other in, one, in, in those spaces to make sure that children have full access to the cultural capital. All right, and I just put your, um, a link to your website in the chat. 
Yes, yes. We have about five minutes. Yeah, yeah. I, don't always, I don't always update the website, but it's on Facebook too. So yeah, any other questions, you can feel free to unmute and just and ask and throw out there. And then there, you can also, I just want to share real quick my screen, just so that you know, folks who have been participating on the, um, on the uh, Google Jamboard, you, you can hit these three dots and then it lets you download the entire, um, the entire Jamboard as a PDF. And so if you feel like, wow, you know, there were some tips on there, there were some things I'd love to uh, think more on. I think it takes a little while for it to make it, but uh, it'll make the PDF for you and you'll be able to carry that as a takeaway from our conversation. This That's great, Janet. Thank you for giving us that little tip. I just clicked on it. So we'll see, we'll see how long it takes, but. Okay, so we have a question from Rana. Um, bridging and relations is so important to addressing biases. How do we avoid tokenizing people mm -hmm. or cultures as we do this? So I think that the, when we think about um, one of the dangers is things become transactional, right? Like people will tokenize um, and, and, and kind of diminish the humanity of the characters or stories or spaces um, partially because you know, people, the ways that we access and share cultural capital and social capital, um, people feel like once I've attached to you, I can now gain something uh, cr like credibility or now I, I belong. And so I think, you know, in some cases, um, it's because folks have not engaged in deep work. And um, I think, you know, when we, that part about being self-reflective, um, it should give us Cause, and I, I feel like this is where, you know, even children of color, like I see my children, they'll ask me, you know, as they're getting ready, like, you know, let them think about wearing a ninja costume. And they're like, mom, is this appropriation? Is this cultural appropriation? And the fact that they're asking the question, right? Like they have triggered inside of themselves this um, loop, a feedback loop to say and question their actions. And that, Again, I go back to praxis. They can watch a show and they can say, well, that show only has, you know, one or two characters and they're just, uh, you know, they just make the main character look more uh, fun or cool or engaging, it's not real. So one of the things is that if it's not authentic and that person is not telling their own story and living their own dreams and you don't know, um, or you're joining into an event like, you know, um, and, and you're going there just to take pictures of it and then not, not it's transactional. You're, you're taking from it, but you're not gifting and giving and being a real partner in that community. And it, then it, it's not the Saulubona. We don't exist for one another. Um, so until you, a person has engaged in holding space from, for someone from that background or holding space to learn more about that culture, and to have true and genuine respect and regard. And to some degree, personally, I hold awe. It triggers for me awe to witness culture and people living and enjoying and celebrating their identity. I experience um, that neurochemical joy to see that, that humanity. So I think for our children, it's instilling in them that they question, you know, is this appropriation, is this tokenization? Um, is this authentic? Do I know this person's story? Do they have agency? Um, and then for ourselves as adults, am I going here just for the, you know, photos, the, the Instagram worthiness of it? Or do am I learning and, and deepening my children's ability to feel connected in a, a global community, right? So um, all of that. And, and you'll know it. I always find that I know it from the ways that which we are engaging in that space in the way that families are engaging with me in that space because I do a lot of festival blogging. Um, that's my jam and I love to be in relationship and in community and to learn and to come and show up as a learner, right? Like that's huge. So thank you for that great question. Yeah, that was great. And I know we're, let's see. Um, yep, appreciate framing this centered on the humanity and agency of others, exactly. Um, and we're at 7.30 and, and I wanna respect everybody's time. And this has been such an amazing, amazing program. I, um, I'm always so um, moved by, by the conversations that come from, from the community and that we're able to engage in here.
Thank you for sharing your email in the chat, yeah. Janet. Yeah, I just always do in case there was something I did I missed and you missed your question. I just want to let you know in this space, we're also in co-creation and um, there's things I do for families and, and bridging work that I do. And so I, I believe that, you know, this is where the transformation and change happens is with the children. So, yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Andrea. I appreciate you coming this evening. Thank you, everyone. It's been really beautiful to, um, to share this space with you. This has been great. And we do, again, we have these programs um, the third Wednesday of every month and next month. Um, if some of you parents out there are um, wondering how to deal with your teens, or maybe, you know, maybe there's other teens in your life, we're having a program on March 17th. It's called um, Let's Talk About Yeet. And if you don't know what yeet is, then maybe you should come and we can learn about what yeet is. I know because I have a teenager gaming in the other room. So I know what yeet means. So it's, we're gonna talk about how to use um, positive youth development for um, establishing supportive and productive relationships with teens. So I think that'll be another um, pretty interesting topic. So always check out jeffcolibrary.org. Thank you again, Janet, for showing, showing up and bringing your authentic self and your expertise and your passion. And this has been such a wonderful, wonderful evening. And I thank you all for making space for us tonight. Thanks so much.